We come now in this fifth lecture in our handout theology to the subject of revelation. Let me read the various propositions and then develop them for you in this half hour. One, we have been feeling around in the dark. Since there is a God, surely he will enlighten us. No doubt we start in the dark, so we will know early that we cannot make our journey without God. Two, suppose we had never opened our eyes, ears, and other senses to receive the stimuli about us, then nothing would have been revealed to us. Three, suppose we had opened our eyes, ears, and other senses to receive the stimuli about us, and we had no brain and mind to interpret them for us, then nothing would have been revealed to us. For nothing is revealed to rocks and blades of grass, and nothing important to dogs and orangutans. Five, man is built to receive messages from the world around and within him and trace them to their source. Six, so God made us to be receivers of his messages. Man has been defined as a tool maker. Far more important, man is a receiver of divine messages. Seven other creatures in this world get some of these messages, but we are the only ones who get the messages and the message sender. Eight, without these messages and the sender, human life would not be worth living. Indeed, it could not be lived without him. This is life eternal that they know thee, the only true God. Nine, receiving these messages and the sender is what we are here for because it is the most important thing that ever happens to us. It is life. Ten, we call this revelation. It is a disclosure of the sender himself in his message, especially about sin and redemption. And God puts this revelation in a book, as we shall see in the next lecture. I think most of you who are believing Christians and quite uh, persuaded of the revelation of Holy Scripture and the divine Son of God will be glad to see us moving into that uh, area. I'm commenting on the fact in the first proposition that we've been feeling around in the dark. We've been trying to understand without the special light from heaven that we have in Holy Scripture. But since there is a God, and we learn that from contemplating the things he's made, the visible things, as Paul says in Romans, reveal or declare the invisible God, and surely he will enlighten us. No doubt we start out in the dark, so we'll know early that we cannot make our journey without God. There's an interesting point here about revelation and uh, the natural revelation which precedes it. There are some, as I alluded in the first lecture, who don't believe there's any natural theology or even in some cases a natural revelation at all. That we simply must begin with special revelation and that in Holy Scripture. But the fact of the matter is that Scripture itself tells us there is such a thing as a revelation of God's handiwork in heaven and in earth and that we do know from the things he's made as well as the things he's written that there is a God. Not only that, that is the verity that there is such a thing as we've been engaging in for the last four lectures as natural revelation and natural theology, there is a sense in which it's necessary if we're going to appreciate special revelation to which we now come. The great B.B. Warfield made a special point of that precisely because near the end of his life, mysticism and anti-rationality was coming into play and he saw the danger of it. 
before he died in 1921. Well, his basic point was this, and an absolute antithesis to the death of God theology, which emerged a few decades after his death, that you can't know that there is a word of God, the Bible, unless you know there is a God. You can't know there is a Son of God unless you know there is a God. So the very Bible itself is defined by the knowledge we have before we receive the Bible and the very revelation of the Son of God is literally only possible because we are familiar with God and we learn from Him by special revelation the trinality of God. We had a death of God theologian who made a point of this also, a man named Bahanian who used to teach sociology at Cornell University and was like a number of others of his contemporaries, powerfully influenced by Karl Barth. Barth had been one of those who had no use for natural theology or even natural revelation. He wanted to start immediately with what he arbitrarily called and accepted as revelation. One of the things that led him and a number of other one-time Bardians into this dismal death of God theology, I heard him say at the seminary some years ago when he was commenting on Matthew 16, where Jesus asks, whom do you say that I am? And Peter answers, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Bahanian was pointing out that same thing that if you start with the Bible, take your cues from it, it drives you back to a natural theology. Peter was able to say and identify Jesus because he was aware of the existence of God and could recognize Jesus as the Son of God. But if he had no knowledge of God, he would have been unable to make that good profession. One scholar has pointed out, Macquarie of Oxford to be precise, that every death of God theologian, not just Fahanian, but every death of God theologian was a disillusioned Bardian. And what he meant by that was that they realized this idea of taking the Bible without any ground any evidence, any proof of the existence of God left you without any sound knowledge. You can't say meaningfully that Christ is the Son of God when you don't have any idea of God. So, these disillusioned Bardians just got God out of their thinking, tried to go on without Him, which of course a futile endeavor, but nevertheless it came from the fact that's the reason I'm laboring it here as a historical illustration of the importance of natural theology and natural revelation. It came from the fact that there were scholars in the second quarter of the 20th century and down to the third and so on who really thought you could start with a biblical message without any kind of background orientation. The death of God theologians generally knew better than that, that it was actually impossible. But just going back to this first point, as we come to Revelation now, I don't have to appeal to heterodox theologians, but to the greatest Reformed theologian of the 20th century, B.B. Warfield, as I say, is pointing out the same thing. God reveals himself in the things he's made, and that prepares us for the reception of the things he has revealed in Holy Scripture. Now, that leads me to say another thing at this point, while I'm still tarrying on this first uh, item here. It's a rather tricky matter. While you can't actually, 
can't understand a revelation of God without knowing there is a God at the same time a strange thing happens on the way to natural theology historically we learn that people don't develop a sound doctrine of God apart from Scripture. You can see what got Bart going on this. We gave evidence that there is a God, that He's eternal and unchangeable, He's the source of all that is, omnipresent and omnipotent and so on. It seems to me these arguments are very evident and really quite irrefutable. But at the same time, people don't see them. We don't have any nation which came to theism to practice a belief of God, one God, who didn't do that by means of divine revelation. Funny thing, isn't it? But the three theistic religions in the world are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All the other religions are some variety of polytheism or pantheism or animism, but the only religions called theistic, centering in a belief of God, are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And every one of those, as you know very well, got their doctrine of God not from natural theology. Oh, there were natural theologians among them, Maimonides among the Jews, and of course Aquinas and others among the Christians, and Islam had some very fine thinkers in this regard, but nevertheless, they work within this particular context of biblical revelation. How do we put this together? All I can say is that we ought to know that there is a God if we're ever going to recognize that there is a Word of God, and it is really senseless to say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God if you have no notion of what God is. But at the same time and in the same breath, I have to say, as a matter of fact, historical fact, from the beginning to the present day, no group of people seem ever to have come to a sound doctrine of God through the things He's revealed and the things He's made. They should. But they don't, they haven't, and I think they won't. They suppress that evidence we learn from Romans. They don't welcome it. That's the real problem, you see. That knowledge is necessary for a knowledge of the Word of God and the Son of God, and these people do get it. As Romans says, they know God. Knowing God, non testant they are. They know God, but they do not worship Him as God. Three times in that first chapter, Paul says, they would not have God in their thinking. They would not have God in their thinking. They would not have God in their thinking. So you see what the problem is? Not the problem of natural revelation and natural theology, but the problem of the unwillingness of the observer of the things of God, uh, of God's creation, to acknowledge that God. We realize there's a hatred to it for Him. There's some resistance to it. But let me say this in conclusion on this point. Much as they hate it, much as they try to eradicate it, much as they avoid it in the establishment of their religion, at the same time, they can't divest themselves of it. They have God in their thinking. It's there. That knowledge is inescapable, but they don't worship Him as God. They try to disembowel themselves of the knowledge of God. They turn their back on God and worship idols and all the rest of it. But all of that is one furious and unending attempt to escape the knowledge which does come through the things He's made and which they do have. You could put that picture together as well as you can, but I'll have to go on right now 
after having tried to show by this observation how important what we have been doing in the first four lectures is, apropos what we will be doing hereafter, and we have a revelation with which to conjure. Number two, suppose we had never opened our eyes, ears, and other senses to receive the stimuli about us, then nothing would have been revealed to us. We have to be a certain type of being, you know, to receive revelation is what I'm mentioning here. Number three, suppose we had opened our eyes, ears, and other senses to receive the stimuli about us, and we had no brain and mind to interpret them for us. Then nothing would have been revealed to us. We could grasp something, but we couldn't deduce its meaning. So there would be really no knowing of what God has done. I've always had a dog in our family, and I'm always chewing the dog out because he never thanks God. He's a magnificent creature. Those sharp eyes, that vile tongue of his, those glaring teeth, that powerful run that he has, he drags me after him by the half mile, and so on. But I have to do all the work. I have to thank God for what a magnificent specimen of creation he has given me in that particular dog. The dog doesn't have any gratitude. He never says thank you to God. And he's a walking apologetic. But his master has to do the job, and of course that's the reason God has given us these magnificent creatures who are subordinate to us, to magnify him for them who themselves cannot articulate what we creatures are able to do. Now the fourth point, nothing is revealed to rocks and blades of grass and nothing important to dogs and orangutans. Orangutans are apparently the highest IQ among the uh, creatures below us, but they don't have any knowledge like this. They could be marvelously trained, to be sure, but not in divine worship. Number five, man is built to receive messages from the world around him and within him and trace them to their sources. As I said a moment ago, as a dog or whatever it may be, in a certain sense, we're all carrying out the Adamic assignment of naming the creature, classifying everything that was made. That is our special job, and it's still going on, and it will go on as long as this world does actually stand. Six, God made us to be receivers of his messages. Man has been defined as a tool maker, but far more important, man is a receiver of divine messages. We say anthropos, you know, man as the uplooker. And that is indeed a cue to us who instead of walking on four legs, actually walk on two and have our face upward toward him who actually uh, made us. But those who travel otherwise, of course, don't see what we see even in themselves. But we are the ones who, obviously, are primarily message receivers from God. No other creature can do that. We can. We alone can take the data he's given us and fall on our knees and praise him. We can sing our hallelujah choruses. We can adore him. And we can take all that he has made and gather it together as one pean of praise to his name. That's our job. Worship is our preeminent activity. And we are the only ones in this lower world of ours who are able to do it so that you realize everything else is made for us so that we are made for God and adore him by the things he has revealed to us in nature. Seven, other creatures in this world get some of these messages, but we're the only ones who get the messages and the message sender. That's, of course, the real name of the game. Not so much the message, wonderful as that is, but the message sender, the one from whom the message comes. He gives himself along with what he says, and it's our inestimable privilege of being the only creatures in this lower world who can not only receive his messages, but can actually receive him. And before we're finished with this course, we'll see the indescribably wonderful way 
in which he actually dwells in us as if we were a temple that he occupied as we gather together his praises in our worship. Number eight, without these messages and the sender, human life would not be worth living. Indeed, it could not be lived without him. This is life eternal, that they know thee, the only true God. Those are Jesus' words, you remember, that he uttered in the great high priestly prayer. But we knew that when Peter was offended at him at one time and his teachings were alienating a large group of his followers. And the apostles, speaking through Peter, said, Lord, and he, you leave me too? So many others were offended and going away. You're going to leave me too? You remember Peter's answer? Lord, you have the words of life. To whom else can we go? It's almost as if to say, yes, Lord, we would. If there was any place else to go. But you're it. No matter what you say, no matter how much it troubles us and alienates them, we can't leave you. Your life itself couldn't possibly go from you, but that's the only reason. Not because they weren't offended at what he said. Not that they weren't tempted as the others, but because they knew one thing clearly. To leave him was to leave life. To part from Christ was to choose death. This is life eternal that they know thee. This isn't just a course in theology in that sense, see. This is a theology which is not merely a knowing of the message from God, but a knowing of the sender himself. I mean, after all, you're flabbergasted and rendered incredible by the news that God himself has actually, as Calvin says, opened his mouth and lisped, spoken baby talk to us so that he could reveal to us the inmost intentions of his heart. That itself is, you can't believe it. Our creator actually carrying on a conversation with the likes of us. There's no use reeling at that one because he actually gives himself, not just his message, but he gives himself. This is life eternal, that they know thee. And the only way they're going to know him as well as his message is in this message of revelation. It never comes. We haven't mentioned that before, but before we leave this liaison between natural revelation and special revelation, let us notice that even though special revelation presupposes a divine being who is revealed in the things which are actually made, at the same time, God never communicates himself savingly by the things he's made. They know there's a God by the visible things, but they don't know God. As a matter of fact, they reject even the knowledge of him. So far from desiring to know him, they don't want even to have his message. You see, this natural revelation of ours is unto damnation. We're going to see as we move into the area of biblical revelation, special revelation, that the gospel is unto salvation. But you'll never find in the Bible or in any historical phenomena I'm familiar with anybody who ever came to salvation merely through the knowledge that comes from the moon and the stars and the sun and the planets. But they do come to damnation. What Paul is laboring there in that first chapter of Romans that the revelation of nature is so clear that there is no excuse whatever for them not knowing God and therefore worshiping as God. They are without excuse. He says, because they do learn from nature enough to worship God and follow God and do God's will, but they do not do it. They are without excuse. They are damned. 
They are under the wrath of God. His wrath is revealed from heaven against all the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I hope you get what I'm driving at here especially. I've made a point because I think it is very vital that there is such a thing as natural revelation and natural theology, and it's actually the foundation for special theology, even so far as to say that if you didn't have it, namely the knowledge of God, you couldn't really recognize that the Bible is the Word of God and Jesus is the Son of God. That's how important it is, how indispensable it is, how impossible it is to start with the Bible, period. I mentioned to you at the outset of these lectures that you can start with the lecture we come to next because people in the Christian tradition do usually like to start with the Bible. But if you do that, you should work back ultimately to these things and you should realize the importance of them as something you're assuming when you do take off in your biblical studies. But as a sort of grand conclusion here, the revelation of God through nature, which is unmistakable and people have gotten it, but it has stirred up their opposition and so they're without excuse. They are under damnation. No one comes to the worship of God or the salvation of God, but actually to the further damnation by that source. If anyone is going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, as I pray all of you who have not already so come, will, it's not going to come through what you know by the things God has made, but through what you know by the things he has revealed. Because in the communication of that message, he is pleased to communicate himself, the sender of that message.